Oh, hey, welcome to our service tonight. It is uh, great to see you tonight. Well, what I'm holding in my hand right here is actually something I picked up in Cambodia on a uh, missions trip there to uh, be able to see what God's doing in Cambodia. And uh, so I picked up this souvenir. You know, I, I often think about these type of things that are in my office. If, if my office was all sudden buried and a thousand years later, somebody were to uncover my office, would they look at something like this and go, Oh, surely they were idol worshipers. They had little idols and little things like this in their office. Or would they realize it was just decoration? Is this just a piece of uh, artwork that was in our office? You know, it's, it's amazing to think that when, you know, the future goes through our leftovers, if you would, you know, what are they going to think of uh, our decorations, of our offices? Are they going to think that our church was actually into idol worship? No, this isn't an idol. This is just a piece of artwork that I picked up as a souvenir in Cambodia. But what will they think in the future if all of a sudden my office was buried and uh, discovered a thousand years later? It's kind of interesting to think like that. Well, anyways, I'm really excited about today. We're going to be continuing to discover artifacts from the divided kingdom of Israel. But before we get there, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father God, I just thank you for this opportunity to be able to share some of these amazing discoveries showing the biblical narrative to be, in fact, true. And Lord, I just pray that you'd be with us tonight and uh, that you would bless this service in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Are the events in the Bible true? Are they historic facts? Or are they merely legend? Does the historical record show the Bible to be true? Or is it filled with fantasy? In this series, we are going to uncover the greatest archaeological discoveries of all time, showing that the Bible is indeed historic fact. This is Unearthing the Bible. Welcome back. For thousands of years, mankind has been moved by the biblical events of creation, Adam and Eve, the flood, the patriarchs, the exodus, the wandering in the desert, the conquest, and the judges, the time of the united monarchy under Saul, David, and Solomon. But are these stories true? Is there extra biblical evidence for these people, places, and events? Last week we discovered the Shoshak the first Megiddo stele. This fragment of a victory stele was found at Megiddo and contains the cartouche of Pharaoh Shoshank the first, which was the biblical Pharaoh of Shishak, known also as Shashak. According to Egyptian records and a list of cities displayed in Karnak in the Karnak Temple, Pharaoh Shishak campaigned against Israel and Judah in 925 BC. Once again, another artifact showing the biblical narrative to be true. Last week, we also discovered a seal um, of Jeroboam, which is a seal with a Hebrew inscription belonging to Shema which is a servant of Jeroboam. And it was excavated at Megiddo as well, in the area of the gatehouse or the palace, you know, in the late 10th century BC, where it had been likely kept with other seals for official use. And then last week, we also discovered the Amon Citadel inscription. In the 10th century, Solomon began to follow other gods, that his neighbors had worshipped, such as the god Milcom, which was the chief god of the pantheon in Amon, 
which the book of Kings refers to as a detestable idol. And now we have discovered, you know, artifacts showing that they did in fact worship this evil, disgusting God. Now, today we're going to be continuing, you know, the discovery of the time of the Israelite monarchy and the shattered kingdom of Israel. See, Israel was divided into two kingdoms. Now, the prevailing view about the accounts of the divided kingdom of Israel and Judea, or in Judah, in the Bible are that these books were merely propaganda written by official scribes of the kingdom of Judah to give the people a history and to legitimize their government and to also promote the worship of Yahweh according to the views of the priestly class who had allegedly had invented this new religion and imposed it on a formal, uh, formerly polytheistic Israelites. Now, you know, they, polytheism means multiple gods. They believed in multiple gods. You know, however, the archaeological sources from this time period are so vast and they coincide so well with the biblical narrative that it is an unattainable position to claim that the books of, such as, books of the Bible, such as Kings and Chronicles, are merely propaganda and pseudo-history. It's just not possible because of the archaeological discoveries that we have seen. Now, the artifacts discovered alone indicate a degree of historical proof that is unparalleled for nations and national or national text of that era. So what we have shows more historical proof than any other nation and national text of that era. Now, the split of the united monarchy into separate kingdoms of Israel and Judah occurred about 931 BC, when Jeroboam, the former general, rebelled against Rehoboam, who was the son of King Solomon and heir to the throne. Now, the northern tribes followed Jeroboam, who established his royal residency at Shechem, while the tribes of Judah and Benjamin continued under the rule of Rehoboam. Now, he ruled then at the capital city of Jerusalem. Now, during this time of the divided kingdom period, the northern uh, nation was heavily influenced by foreign nations and adopted many pagan deities and practices. And eventually the kingdom of Israel was completely destroyed and dispersed by the Assyrians in 722 BC. The kingdom of Judah also struggled with polytheism and pagan practices. But many of the kings and leaders followed Yahweh and observed the law of Moses. As the Assyrian Empire expanded, Judah was also attacked in 701 BC, but Jerusalem did not fall. However, foreign powers continued to exert influence as the Egyptian, um, you know, uh, Pharaoh Necho II controlled Judah briefly. Um, and he appointed Jehoiakim as king. Soon after, in 605 BC, the Babylonians subdued Judah as a vassal kingdom, then finally destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 387 BC after a rebellion, and it really brought a complete end to the period of the divided monarchy there in Israel. Now, artifacts from the divided kingdom, which were found in Israel, Moab, Ammon, and Assyria, they illustrate the narratives in the book of Kings, Chronicles, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the Minor Prophets, while demonstrating the historical accuracy of the text through external archaeological evidence. So once again, we can see external archaeological evidence showing that the biblical narrative is indeed fact. Now, our main scripture for today is going to be found in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 45. And it states this, 
<clears throat> now Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder and used to pay the king of Israel. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. Now, is this true? Is there extra biblical uh, evidence for this event? Well, in order to discover any evidence, we need to travel to uh, Dibon there in Moab, which is current day Jordan. Let's go ahead and travel there now. Whew. Hey, we made it. All right, let's go ahead and take a moment and look around. Ooh, that is neat. Look at that. That's interesting. Oh, check that out. I just find all this stuff so amazing. So, yeah, just, it's like looking through a window in time. Going to be able to go back in time and discover all these amazing things. Well, this first discovery that we're going to be discussing tonight is called the Misha of Moab. And we just read in our scripture, the king, Misha of Moab. Now, this is the Misha Stele. Now, let me give you some basic information about the Stele. It dates to the 9th century BC, and it was discovered in uh, Dibon there in Moab, which is current day Jordan. And it was during the period of the divided kingdom. Now, the Misha Stele or Moabite stone is how it's referred to as well, is a 9th century BC stone victory monument composed of 34 inscribed lines and was commissioned by the king Misha and discovered in Moab. Now, the stele is carved uh, balsop from about 835 BC and it measures about five feet tall two and a half feet um, uh, wide and um, is about a foot you know, thick. Now, the inscription, which is the longest known in the Moabite language, it relates a successful victory of Misha, which is the king of the Moabites, over Israel and Judah after his rebellion and refusal to continue to pay tribute to the Israelites. Now, the text names Omri as the king of Israel in the 9th century BC and Misha as the king of Moab in the 9th century BC. Now, it also mentions the tribe of Gad. Now, locations such as Atroth and Dibon and uh, Chemosh, which was the chief god of Moab, were also mentioned there in the lines. And this Steely recounts the rebellion by Moab during the reign of Jehoram from the Moabite perspective and has the earliest known Semitic inscription that mentions Yahweh and even seems to contain an early reference to the house of David. Now, the stele was discovered in the ruins of Dimon uh, in 1868 by the um, you know, Bedouins who were you know, showing it to, off to some missionaries and some scholars who were living in the area. Unfortunately, the Bedouins um, looted and then even smashed the stele during negotiations for its sale. But the recovered pieces were eventually sent to Lovara uh, Museum and reconstructed with the help of a paper squeegee. You know how they would do this and they would make a, a, a copy of it with paper and, and uh, either chalk or some kind of um, you know, uh, uh, wax. And anyways, they would have that pa uh, paper squeegee and it, you know, the, you know, they had did that actually before it was broken. So that helped them put it back together. Now, translations reveal that the Moabite, you know, it was a Moabite perspective about that conflict that is recorded in the Book of Kings, plus additional information about events before and after the uh, conflict, and also insight. It had great insight into the religion of the Moabites as well. Now, the inscription begins with the lineage of Misha, the king of Moabite and uh, recounts how he constructed a sanctuary to the god of Chemosh. 
Now, in lines five and eight in the stele, describe how Omri, the king of Israel, had oppressed the, Moabite, the Moabites and had taken the land of Medabah and continued through half of the reign of his descendant, Jehoram. Now, the line three then mentions that Chemosh, the main god of the Moabites, um, is also mentioned, who was also mentioned in the book of uh, Kings as well, uh, is also mentioned in the stele. Now, lines 11, 16, and 17 indicate that the Moabites' um, external inhabitants, um, or um, they exterminated their inhabitants of these captured cities, and they sacrificed these inhabitants to their god, uh, Chemosh. So when they would conquer a city, they would go in and they would sacrifice the inhabitants to their God as human sacrifices, which is also consistent with the biblical account about Misha offering his own son as a sacrifice in order to appease his God, Shemash, and inspired his followers. It's just, just disgusting. Not only did they sacrifice the human inhabitants of the lands they conquered, but he also sacrificed his own child. It's just gross. And then we also see in the stele in line 31 that it is a, um, even though that it's fragmented, um, but using a combination of the details, examination of the stele itself, that paper impression that was taken before the time uh, that it was smashed, and then the early drawings of the stele, based on the imp uh, impression and the fragments, analyzing it, and it, it kind of indicates that there on the bottom, it says the house of David, yeah, near the end of the text there on the stele as well. So this stele is just, uh, just a wealth of amazing information, some disturbing, but it has Yahweh on there, it has uh, Omri, it has so much different information from the biblical narrative. Now, the remainder of this stele recounts, now uh, continuing on, recounts the multiple Moabite victories over Israel and also details how uh, Misha led a successful campaign against the cities of Israel. And, um, you know, really sustaining, you know, that claim in the book of Kings that the land was conquered by Omri was taken back by the Moabites in the days of Misha. So the Bible recounts that. And now we find extra biblical evidence showing that the king Misha truly existed, that Omri in the Bible truly existed, that the events that happened, they truly happened. And that it wasn't just a you know, pseudo history made up by uh, a bunch of scribes and, and people trying to give people a, a heritage. No, no, no. This was actual biblical uh, events that happened. And now we can see extra biblical evidence for those events. Now, I don't be you, but I found that amazing. Uh, tonight, we have two more discoveries. I want to move on to our next discovery because it's pretty interesting. And uh, let's go ahead and do that. But in order to dis, you know, take a look at this discovery, we need to travel to the ancient city, the ancient ruins of Reof there in Israel. Let's go there now. Hey, we made it. All right. Let's take a moment and look around. Oh, man. Just so interesting. Man, Ooh, watch your step, watch your step. Oh man, that is just amazing. This stuff is just so fascinating. I just, just a, every, every piece of history, every piece showing the biblical narrative to be true, every little detail, it just, it just strengthens your faith. It just makes you uh, realize, you know, how accurate and how true the biblical narrative truly is. These aren't made up stories. Obviously, we have extra biblical accounts from the enemies of Israel that uh, these events truly happen. I just find it just amazing. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at this artifact that was discovered here. And this is called the Elisha Pottery, or it is also called the Elisha Ostrakon. Now, let me give you some basic information about this Ostrakon. It was from the 9th century BC, and of course it was discovered here at Rehov in Israel. And it was during that period of the divided kingdom and the time of Elijah and Elisha. And it was an ancient 
Hebrew ostrakon that reads, check this out, belonging to Elisha. And it was discovered in the 9th century BC. And it was discovered in the 9th century BC house during excavations in the ruins of Rehov. During, uh, and during this time, they discovered that it was uh, written on it with using a reddish ink. And it was written in archaic Hebrew script. And the owner Mar was basically just marking his property, writing his name on it, in essence. And uh, although the prophet who you know, came after Elijah was named Elisha, and he did indeed live during this time period in the 9th century BC, and he was born several miles away in Abel of Mehala, and uh, you know the Rehov uh, house here, in which the Ostrakhan was found, is almost certainly not of the house of Elisha of the Bible, the Elisha of you know that is the prophet. But it you know, the, and the reason why we think that is because this particular house actually was full of idols and pagan altars, which obviously the prophet preached against, you know, and, and served Yahweh. So we know that this is just somebody else that is named Elisha. But we do know that it's pretty interesting because even though this might not be the Elisha, the prophet's house, we can see that the Ostrakhan does attest to the use of the name Elisha in the 9th century BC in the kingdom of Israel and in the general area of where Elisha was born and lived. So what this does is this shows that the time period in which the Bible uses the name Elisha is accurate to the time period, to the region, and it really does illustrate that even the small details of names and timings and stuff like that uh, are accurate within that particular time period. All right, I would also like to take a look at the, uh, another scripture and uh, so we can take a look at another discovery. And this is found in 1 Kings and, uh, chapter 20 and verse 21 and states this, Ahab, king of Israel, went out and struck the horses and chariots and killed the Armenians with a great slaughter. And then Benadad came out to him, and he took him up into the chariot. Now, this is an amazing story. But did it happen? Is this a true event? Well, in order to discover, to discover if there's any extra biblical evidence for these people, places, and events, we need to travel again. We need to travel to ancient uh, Kirk, which is in Turkey. Let's go there now. Whew. Hey, we made it. We are at another location. So let's just go ahead and take a moment and look around at all these amazing events. Oh, man. Ooh, check that out. No matter how many of these different places you go to, even just seeing ruins, man, it just makes your imagination come alive. Looking at all what the people experienced and did, and uh, just so interesting. Well, what we're going to discover here about Ahab, and we're going to take a look at Ahab and his army. And this particular discovery is called the Kirk Steely of Shaman Eser III. All right, uh, Ezer the third. All right, let's take a look at some basic information. It dates to um, about 852 BC, and it is, was discovered there in Kirk, the which is west of uh, Bismil, uh there in Turkey. And this was, of course, during this time period of the divided kingdom. Now, this stele of uh, Shamanizer the third was commissioned by a king of Assyria who reigned approximately 859 to 824 BC and was one of two monolithic Assyrian stelia found in the town of Kurt. Now, this was, once again, is in modern day southeast Turkey, which is west of Lake Van, if you were looking it up on the map. Now, this is part of a pair of um, uh, Shalmaneser III and his father, um, Ashura Nazar Paul II, uh, the monolith depicts 
Shalmaneser III and commemorates his successful campaigns. So all those big uh, uh, weird names, you know, this is a stele that just uh, shows the different campaigns he had and his successes. Now, among other battles, the cuneiform text recounts the Battle of Karkar, which um, occurred about 553 BC and mentions King Ahab the Israelite with his contribution of 2,000 chariots and 10,000 soldiers to a, uh, the opposing defeat a coalition of 12 kings. Now, the chariot forces of Ahab is the largest of any in the coalition. And it demonstrates his military might and also emphasizes his use of chariots in battles. Now, while this particular event is not mentioned in the Bible, Ahab was a wealthy and powerful king who was also involved in numerous chariot battles during his reign. Evidence from archaeological excavations at Jezreel also indicates that he maintained large portions of his chariot you know, troops at the royal fortress city in a rectangular fortification comprised of walls that are about 860 feet long and 470 feet wide, where a huge enclosed courtyard was discovered that could um, accommodate thousands of chariots. So I just find this so amazing that you can even look at the biblical example of an evil king. Ahab was a horrible king. He uh, and his wife, you know, Jezebel, are so well-known, some of the most well-known kings in the Bible, not because of their greatness, but because of their evil. But here we can see extra biblical evidence that King Ahab actually existed. He's not just a made-up story. He's not just trying to give the Israelites some history. This was an actual king that, of Israel that actually existed. And I just find that so amazing. Well, I hope you enjoyed our lesson tonight, and I, I do want to do a quick recap to just kind of refresh our memory. The first discovery we had tonight was uh, the uh, Misha Stelia, the, the king Misha from you know uh, Moab. And uh, so once again, the Misha Steli, or the Moabite Stone, as it's also called, was that 9th century BC victory stone monument, and it comprised of 34 inscripted lines and was commissioned by King Misha. You know, and it was discovered in Moab. And uh, it talks about how they rebelled against the Israelites and how that's also shown in Scripture. And then we discovered the um, Elisha Ostrakhan. And it was an amazing discovery because this ancient Hebrew Ostrakhan reads, Belonging to Elisha. Now, we know that this isn't the Elisha of uh, the prophet Elisha of the Bible, but it is during the same time period, the 9th century BC. And it was also, what it does is it shows that the, uh, the accuracy of even the names were used in the proper time period, showing that biblical accuracy is indeed um, true. And then this last one we just talked about, which is the Stele of Shalmaneser III. And among, once again, among other battles, the uh, cuneiform text recounts the Battle of Karkar, which you know occurred about 553 BC, and it mentions the king Ahab of Israel and his contribution to the battle of 2,000 chariots and 10,000 soldiers, showing that, yes, the king Ahab of the Bible was a real person. Jezebel, she was real. Some of the stories and the disgusting things they did is just amazing. So when we hear about Elijah standing up to Jezebel and all her prophets, we know these aren't just stories. These are actual biblical events. And we know for a fact that King Ahab and his mighty army truly existed. And I just find this fascinating, amazing, and just, just it really does build your faith. And it does mine. I, I just find it just such an amazing time to be able to look at these ancient sites, to be able to look at these ancient discoveries and to show that that 
you know, the biblical narrative is, is indeed true. So let's go ahead and uh, close in prayer, and I hope you are encouraged tonight. Father God, you're so awesome. Thank you so much for um, allowing us to find some of these discoveries. Lord, to see that King Ahab actually existed, to look at, at King Misha of Moab, to see his victory steely, and to see that he did rebel against Israel and, and uh, the battles they had. And Lord, also to see that Ostrakhan of, of Elisha. No, it's just amazing to know that the prophet Elisha was a real person, that we can see that his name was proper in the time period and that these small details are accurate, which shows that the bigger details are also accurate. And I just find that amazing. So, Lord, I just pray that you would allow these, this encouragement to sink into our heart and to build our faith and to strengthen us. In Jesus' holy and mighty name, amen. God bless you. And thank you for being with us tonight on Unearthing the Bible.